Okay, so let's pray together. Uh, dear God, we want to thank you for the book of Hebrews and the special place it has in your revealed will, uh, your revelation of who you are. We pray, Lord, that all of the blessing in which it was intended to have uh, to the church and to our lives individually as Christians, that we would receive that uh, tonight as well as as we continue our own personal uh, growth through reading that the book of Hebrews. We thank you for this and we pray, Lord, that you would guide uh, this reading of your word and this uh, exploration of, of who you are and what you desire for our lives tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I was thinking today about um, inventions that were kind of overhyped to be like game changers in the world and they just totally fell flat in one way or another and there's tons of examples but one that came to my mind pretty quickly was Google Glass if you guys remember back in like 2013 when there was all of these announcements and news articles about Google Glass, these type of glasses that you would wear, uh, and they it had like a little display here. It looked really sci-fi. It kind of promised to do all of these amazing things for you, and it really was hyped to be kind of this game changer, where man, this is going to revolutionize the way that we interact with the world and and have you know technology integrated with our lives, and you know the world will never be the same again after Google Glass hits the scene. And then it hit the scene and then like just nothing happened. Apparently like almost no one bought it. Uh, it was super expensive, it caused headaches. It was like, even before it was launched, it was banned in most like places like banks and gyms and, and changing rooms and all this kind of stuff. You just weren't allowed to wear them. And so for all these different reasons, uh, it apparently didn't work very well. Like, you know, there was all these health concerns about brain uh, like damage that may be done with it. And, this is all of these terrible like reasons why it just fell completely flat. And so there's so many examples that we could look at and think about of different ways that we were promised this big change, promised this big, uh, you know, whatever, this, this shift in life, the shift in, in the way that like everything is done. And it didn't help, it didn't work, it, it really just fell flat, it was just a fad, here today, gone tomorrow. And so perhaps we're kind of used to these, these spiels. But the gospel is something that's meant to make those kind of changes too. I don't know if you're sitting here tonight and you maybe have a similar kind of sentiment towards the gospel, thinking, you know what, I became a Christian and it, meant to, it was meant to make all of these changes in my life and it really didn't. You know, I'm still the same, the same person basically I was before. My life hasn't changed in, in any real way. And if that's the case, then I want to I, I want to be honest with you. Like that, there is something amiss there, because the Bible is supposed to change our life. If the if the gospel is something that only makes a difference to your you know where you are geographically geographically on a Sunday, like oh I'm at church instead of at home, like if that's the only change it makes, like that's pretty sad. There's so much more that's supposed to happen there. There's, there's, it's almost like you know you have a really you know awesome smartphone and you're using it to like hammer and nails. It's like that's not really the the point of it. There's supposed to be a tremendous amount more that's uh, happening with this as well. The gospel is meant to kind of be a, have this very pervasive relevance for everyday life, where it just flows out and it doesn't really leave any stone unturned. Your life changes when you become a Christian, when you accept Jesus Christ in. And uh, there's, a, there's a quote that I love uh, by uh, A.W. Tozer, which is, um, the person who is not changed by grace is not saved by grace. I think there's a, there's a real, we need to be honest about that, the impact it's supposed to have on our life. And if you don't have that impact, and you know, some people's lives change slowly, some of them change dramatically, so please, uh, I'm not trying to throw your, your faith into question at any point of this. But you should really examine yourself and say, God, is there something I'm missing here? Is there something I've misunderstood or I'm misapplying? Uh, please, I want to like, lay this at your feet and ask you to change it as well. The whole book of Hebrews has been uh, this huge long reminder to the audience of how great the gospel really is. How amazing it is that Jesus Christ has done what he's done. How there's no better sacrifice, there's no uh, greater security, there's no greater blessing that we can find anywhere uh, through any religion or any philosophy of life than that found uh, through what Christ has done and said. And that's been the whole point of the book of Hebrews. And so now as we come to a close, 
It closes by <laughs> reminding the audience of the effect it's supposed to have. And just to go one verse back to verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 28, uh, we see uh, that one beautiful word that uh, is a hinge uh, so often in the Bible, the word therefore. Therefore, essentially saying, you know, given everything I've spoken about, what are we going to do? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Now remember, there was no uh, chapter or verse breaks in the original Bible. So if, even though now we have sort of a break here that says, okay, now it's chapter 13, it keeps going. Really, the, the thought was just continuous. It flowed on to uh, the verse 1 that we're going to read in just a moment. The idea is that this is what worship looks like. Therefore, you've heard the gospel, you've heard all it is, now this is what our life, this is, we worship God and we worship God this way as we continue through verse 1. The Christian life, uh, Christian living is supposed to be a response to something. It's supposed to be birthed out of a change that has happened in our heart. We don't just have this law, and I was listening to um, the J.D. Greer sermon uh, in preparation for, for the message. And I love one of the analogies he used. He says, we know with the gospel, or with particularly the book of Hebrews, and we haven't just been given a law and saying, okay, this is how you're now to live your life, and this is, you know, this is the way forward. He said, if that was the case, that the law would act kind of like a train track, where you know, we have these tracks going forward, and the tracks are going to get you to the right place. You know, they're pointing in the right direction. That's the way you're supposed to be going in life. And law does function like that. It'll just sort of say, okay, this is where you have to go, much like train tracks. But he says, we don't have that because if all we had was train tracks, it wouldn't be enough. He says, we've been given an engine to move us along these tracks as well. That, that, that the gospel has put this energy and this power within us, not only to just show us the way, but to give us the motivation to take that way in our life and to move us the way that God is calling us to move. We are given this a really strong power that is all-encompassing in our life, that it moves every area of our life towards the, the, you know, the fulfillment of the will of God for us as well. And so we're going to go through this now together. And really, this is like 10 sermons, not one sermon, because it's this quick-fire type of instructions being given here throughout uh, the, the rest of the chapter. It's all of these different, like, okay, do this and 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 do this. And we're just going to have to go quickly through it because there's no other way that we're going to be able to tackle it tonight. But it's worth you just sitting down and thinking about it step by step as well uh, when you get home tonight. So verse 1, and we're going to go, I'm going to read one verse at a time and then talk about it a little bit, then another verse and talk about it. So keep your Bibles out, all right? So verse 1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Love within the church is paramount to the Christian life that we love each other as brothers and sisters with this familial kind of love, this Philadelphia kind of love, Philadelphia <coughs> brotherly love, uh, which I hear is ironic if you're American because bro Philadelphia is a really hosp in a inhospitable place that's <laughs> named brotherly love. So anyway, I'm not American. I have no opinion on the matter. But that is what we're called to have. This love for one another is supposed to be a, an, a hallmark of Christian life. Uh, Jesus says it in John 13, 35, where he says, uh, By this the world will know that you are my disciples for the, by the love you have for one another. By the love you have for one another, the world will know that you are my disciples. I know that's very uh, almost popular these days to be like, Oh, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. You should realize that if you have that attitude, the Bible tell, like, speaks against that. You can be very critical of the church, but, and that's okay, as long as you realize that we're called to love each other, um, much like a family would. Verse 2, our love does not stop there. Do not forget to show hospi hospitality to strangers, for by, do for, sorry, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. That's a weird thing to say, right? Like, but what they're probably, what he's probably referring to here is uh, Ge Genesis 18, where Abraham uh, just was hospitable to these three men that he had never met before, but he invites them in, and they turn out to be angels. And you can read that story if you like. 
But it is, a, I think, it's supposed to be used as a motivation to say, by being hospitable to others, we know that God blesses this. We know that God is right with you if you're doing this. He loves it when you do that. And so expect that God's going to bless you as you do His will. It's going to be a blessing to your life as well. It's an amazing uh, historically uh, account uh, of the effect that this has had. See, the hospitality and the kindness that we are to show to others as Christians is key also to Christian witness. To, to know that we are distinctive and we are different uh, is shown by the hospitality that we are meant to have for others. So writing uh, in the fourth century, uh, I read about this today, it was amazing. Uh, the Roman Emperor uh, Julian uh, wrote this. Now he calls Christianity atheism, just so you know, okay? And that's going to be very important in understanding this quote. He's called atheism because Christians denied all other gods except for their own. And to, to, to the Romans, that was atheism. It was a denial of the existence of the pantheon of gods. It's atheism. So he says this, uh, atheism, here Christianity, okay, uh, has, been, has been especially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor but for ours as well. So he is not a friend of the Christians at all. And he is saying these annoying Christians, the reason that they're spreading so quickly is because they keep caring for the poor. And then not only do they care for their own poor, they're caring for our poor people. The ones that we're supposed to be caring for, and we're not, they're caring for them too. And so, man, like, give us a break, guys, essentially. It's like, come on, like, what the heck is going on here? So we are meant to be showing hospitality towards the strangers, the outsiders, to invite them in, to invite them into our fellowship. To enjoy uh, the things that we enjoy and, and make an impact in the world in that way. That is huge for us. Uh, verse 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Now, the context of here seems to apply uh, most uh, prevalently to Christians who have been jailed for their faith or have been persecuted for their faith. Now, it certainly doesn't stop there. And we know as Christians we have to care for all people and we have to be interested in the sufferings of all people. That is uh, clear to us, or at least it should be. But the context of this particular command does seem to be those who are part of the body of Christ and who are suffering. We want to have such feelings towards them as if we are the ones that are in prison with them. We care about them deeply. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this fact, but you should be, because there is a tremendous amount of persecution in the church today, for the church today. Uh, according to a 2010 study uh, of sort of violence around the world, 80% of religious violence is committed against Christians in a, on a world scale. 80% of the religious violence committed is committed against Christians. There is a thousands and thousands of Christians every year that die for their faith. There's so many more that are persecuted for their faith. Today, it's happening right now. And we are called to remember that in our prayers. That we are to pray for them in such a way that we pray for their needs, the same way that we will pray for our own needs. And we are very good at praying for our needs. We need to become very good at praying for the needs of the persecuted church as well. This is a command given to us in the Bible to do so. We are to love and care for them in such a way that as if we ourselves were being mistreated and persecuted. And you can imagine the way that you would be praying in those situations for yourself. You should have that same intensity of prayer for those who you know right now are suffering around the world. I mean, Easter in Sri Lanka and then later uh, earlier this week in, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso, there was more. Uh, uh, attacks as well. It, it's still happening all the time around our world. So this is where we come to a shift in perspective. Right now we've been talking about love and we're told basically three different types of relationships that are supposed to have this love to, to them, loving for each other, loving the strangers, loving those who are prisoners and being persecuted. Uh, the shift comes in verse 4 where it starts to, basically talking about purity rather than love. 
So verse 4 says this, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. <laughs> Now, as I said, it's, it's, set up, it's going to set up now to talk about purity for a little while. And so the first thing it talks about is that there's two major ways that we should be distinct from our culture in regards to purity. The first major way that we are to be distinctive, and this is for all generations of Christians all across the world, is our view on sex and intimacy. This is something which we need uh, wherever our culture differs from the biblical mandate, we side with the Bible. And that's going to make us distinct. That marriage is to be honored. In other words, you don't bring, it's no such thing as an open Christian marriage. There is no, uh, like adultery is off the table completely. Uh, things like divorce and extramarital affairs and things like that are not uh, part of God's will. And we see that sex is supposed to happen limited to that context alone. That sex within a marital relationship, a healthy marital relationship, is to be, that's God's will. Anything outside of that is offensive to God and, and will be judged by Him as well. Now, I know that that is so contrary to the way that the world views sex and sexual relationships today. And I know that uh, for you who perhaps are new to the church or uh, new, new to the gospel, you may hear that and think like, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, I've heard these Christians are weird about this, but now I'm seeing it with my own eyes. I wanted to let you know that there are no rules without reason. That God says this, but we uh, know that there are incredibly good reasons as to why He views sex this way. I don't believe that Christianity should be seen as any way uh, uh, sort of anti-sex or anything like that. In fact, that there's a whole book in the Bible devoted to sex. There is a, a tremendously uh, liberating and, and wonderful view that Christians have towards sex. I really don't have time to talk about it because this is not part of the sermon. Uh, but there will be a sermon on this, I'm sure, coming up soon. Uh, just, you know, uh, bug me about it if you don't think I'm coming up with a sermon fast enough. But uh, I, I will gladly defend uh, the Bible uh, when it comes to the Bible's view on sex. And I think there's tremendous reasons why God has that view. So, moving from the first major way that we have to be distinct from culture, that is of sex, and then the second distinctive way is of our view towards materialism and, and money. So verse uh, 5 and 6 say this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do? do to me. So the second major way we are to be distinct is our view towards money. We are not to foster a love for money, a love for material gain and, and the perks of, uh, you know, uh, of having a cushy life and having a life free from, from discomfort. Uh, though, you know, God's blessing may come and that will happen, that certainly isn't something that we see as a great, uh, a virtuous goal for Christians that instead we are to foster contentment. And so the Bible tells us don't chase after that, instead chase after this. Chase after contentment with what you have. Because if you have Christ, anything else you have, uh, it's enough. Because Christ is enough. He is enough. He is able to sustain your soul and provide satisfaction to you in any uh, situation. Now, contentment is particularly hard, I think, for our culture. We are so materially rich, and yet there's evidence all around us that we exhibit far less satisfaction with what we have than any other generational culture. Uh, there have actually been studies about this. A study I read said, so what they did is they examined the diaries of sort of past generations and they examined it against sort of the, the diaries I guess and blogs and whatever that people write today and they say, they say statistically we are, we are filled with more self-pity and more boredom than previous generations which when you think about it on the face is insane because we have far less to be bored about and we have far less to be sad about and just in terms of materialism now I know there's a, there's a very there's a vast gaping vacuum in the heart of all of that. But I know from the outside looking in, you can say, that's crazy. 
we are not a culture that breeds contentment. We're in fact a culture that breeds discontentment. And we are seeing the effects of that today. And the Bible comes and says, if you have Christ, he is absolutely enough. And you don't need anything uh, apart from him. So you work on that contentment that you have. Uh, and now this is something that we can look at today and say, yeah, yeah, I, I have to sort of go in another direction. But the struggle was way more real for them. Hence why in verse 6 it says, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can me immortals do to me? I think the reason that was added to be an encouragement to those who literally their property was being taken from them, their businesses were being taken from them because they were Christians. They were living in the society. They convert and the society is like, you're part of that freakish cult. We are going to take away your, your land. We are going to take away your business. You are ostracized completely. And so to, into that situation, this writer is saying, Christ is enough. Don't worry about these things. Christ is enough. If it's a choice between faithfulness and your livelihood, choose faithfulness because there you will find contentment. And that's a huge choice, but something that they have been called to make. And, I mean, if we're ever in a situation where we have to make that call, uh, we are absolutely called to be faithful and God will meet our needs at that place as well. So, the way the Bible is supposed to act, in this, if you're not sure, is in some ways as a mirror. That we are to look at ourselves and examine ourselves. Now, whenever you look in the mirror, you have an idea as to what you're supposed to look like. And if you see in some way that you're falling short of that, you do something to fix it. If you look at the mirror and you see your hair is all, you know, bleh, then you fix it. You do something about it. If you see a, you know, a makeup smudge or a booger hanging down, you fix it. In the same way, the Bible is supposed to act as a mirror where we look and we don't look to see what we want to see in it, but we see what, what, how it's supposed to look, how we as Christians are supposed to look. We see a, 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 a vision given to us and we say, okay, I see where I'm falling short here. I see where I still need to do some change. And so we begin to make those changes by the grace of God. And so the two areas that have been covered so far in these six verses are that of love and that of purity. So ask yourself, uh, are you content? Are you sexually pure? Are your relationships characterized by the love that you're called to have here? This is this self-examining is supposed to be part of what we're called to here. And by the way, this, just as an aside, uh, sexual immorality and uh, and sort of greed, uh, which is you know verse five and six is kind of about that. They are very often placed together in the Bible, and I think that's because at the root they have the same heart. Mm -hmm. There's a heart of this sort of uh, self-interest that takes you out of bounds of God's provision, that God has provided for you something, some plan or some structure, and you're saying, no, I want more than that, either materially or sexually, and so you begin to go outside of that, and that same heart is at, the, at both. So look at that, look at your heart as the mirror of Scripture uh, looks, you know, shines upon you, and just say, God, where am I falling uh, flat here? And by your grace, how am I going to change that? As we move on, we move on to a sort of church life. That's where, we, where, that's where the writer takes it. He begins to talk about the life within the church and how that's to be characterized too. So in verse 7, we see, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So I think what this is a call to is a call to enter into what we would uh, refer to today as discipleship. To see those who are more mature in the faith, those who are leaders within the church, and say, I want to enter into a discipleship type of relationship, a dynamic with them. I want to see how they do life, and I want to imitate that. I want to you know, grow in my Christ-likeness and use the tools that God has given me to do that. And one of the huge tools is each other. Those who have walked it, walked it further and for longer than us, we look at them and we use them and, and help ourselves to grow through the relationship we we form with them. And I know I used very kind of impersonal language there. They're not tools. They're not to be used. But they are people that we can um, aspire to be like and move in that direction. And that's what we'll be called to do here. Those who have walked the path before us, we want to seek to imitate their faith and to remember them as we go forward. Uh, verse 8. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar uh, which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Now, if you've been tracking with me so far, perhaps this is where you're like, what the heck are you talking about here? So there's a lot of context here. Um, so the, the, the basic message should be clear. Stay grounded in the gospel. Jesus Christ does not change. The gospel will not change, therefore. So if something new comes along, you know, it has to match up with whatever's been said before, with the gospel as it's been presented to us by the Bible. If there's something that's like, well, you know, maybe Jesus Christ isn't the only way, or something like that, well, no, that would be a new gospel. That would be a different thing uh, that's being sa said, and we're called, no, stay true to what Jesus Christ has said, what the gospel is. He doesn't change. Keep grounded. Now, the bit about food here uh, seems quite contextual to what was going on at the time there. The best idea that we have is that it's referring to a type of uh, ceremonial type of uh, meals that were being done by the Jewish people at the time, so which Christians would not be invited to at all. But it, in their way of thinking, the Jewish people would get together and they would have these meals, and the meals would be a way of like communicating with God. Now, I don't want to mean that in a mystical sense, but in the sense of uh, the way that you honor God and please God is to partake in these meals uh, by eating this food and giving thanks to Him. There, therefore, you give, you kind of uh, please Him and you, you worship Him in this sense, but it was very much centered around the meal and the significance of this meal as well. And so the, the writer is saying, look, we're not interested in food. We don't need these kinds of devices because we have Christ, we have grace, this is enough, this is how we communicate and approach God. Through grace we offer our thanks back to Him. We don't need food and, and this kind of stuff for it. Now, uh, it bears a striking resemblance, at least when I read about this, to the way that uh, the theology that surrounds uh, the Catholic idea of Mass and Communion has a very similar kind of bent to it from what I understand. Uh, and if anyone is, is, is a Catholic or former Catholic and, and wants to correct me on this, I really uh, would open the correction. But the best way I understand uh, the Catholic theology that surrounds communion is that by partaking in communion, you are receiving grace. Uh, but by the very act of taking this bread, uh, uh, you, God is imparting grace into your life. The way that the grace functions in the Catholic Church is it's, it's as if God uh, bestowed to the church the sort of all the grace, like this big surplus of grace as a, like as a commodity. Uh, and it's all stored in big warehouses called the church. Uh, and then every time you come to the church, you get given a little bit of grace. You know, they, they take a bit of the God and they give it to you. And that's through uh, partaking in mass and, and going through the sacraments and going through communion and stuff like that, that you get a little bit of grace each time. And so it's very much centered around performing these rituals in, in order to uh, receive what God wants you to have. And so if that's, if I'm off base, uh, please uh, feel free to correct me and I would uh, gladly take it. But that's the best way I understand it from the research I've done. Uh, and that kind of sounds similar to what they're talking about here, which is sad. It's very sad that that's, that's the case, if that's the case. Uh, verse 11 says this, The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make people, the, the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore, for we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. This is an encouragement for the Christians to not be disheartened by the ostracized, uh, by the way that they've been ostracized by the Jewish community. They have been cut off and said, you are not welcome with us, you are not welcome in uh, our synagogues, and to do uh, any kind of religious observances with us anymore, you are cut out. And the writer is saying, by accepting that fate, you are following Jesus Christ outside of the city 
to the way, the way that he went, you're bearing that same disgrace and you're going with him, but you are going to be with him as you do that. You're going to where he was and you're going to be with him, not in the enduring city, which is Jerusalem, but in the enduring city that is to come, which is uh, the kingdom of heaven, uh, where we look forward to as well. So many had been barred from the synagogues, and the writer is saying, do not let that dishearten you. You are following what Jesus Christ went through, and you are going to be with him uh, through that as well. Verse 15, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So at the very end of talking about sacrifices here, he's bringing you back to, okay, what are the sacrifices that we offer to God? What, is he, what does he want from us? And so there are two ways that we bring a quote-unquote sacrifices to God. And both of them are through Christ. Now that cannot be forgotten. That it's through Christ that we bring anything to God. He is the mediator that we have. He is our high priest. It is always through Him and therefore through the gospel of grace. And with that, the first way that we bring sacrifices and pray to God is that we praise and openly profess His name. In worship, we are called as a church to worship Him. To, to, to really profess His name openly and to praise His name. And that is a, a type of sacrifice that we bring. And secondly, we, uh, the second kind of sacrifice is uh, by being generous with what we have towards one another. There's constantly throughout Scripture this beautiful link that God has made between the way that we love others to the way that we love Him. The, the generosity uh, that we show towards others is reflective of the love that we have towards Him. And it's the same way. If we want to offer sacrifices to God, we don't bring it to a temple. We bring what we have and we give it to each other. We, we share with those who have needs and we all build up the community together that way. We have an openness towards uh, people around us, both within and without the church. Uh, we, we have an openness towards them and that is the way that we offer to God is by giving to one another as well. So it's a beautiful way that God has linked the love that we have for Him to the love that we have for the other as well. Verse 17. And this is one that... Um, yeah, I like this one. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as, uh, as those who must give an account. Do this so their work may be, will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Are you listening? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, I mean, it's, it's simple. Be, uh, show respect to church leaders. Um, I think one thing that may help is to have a trust that God uses the body of the church to accomplish things that you alone cannot accomplish. That when we come together, we become more than the sum of our parts. That as a church, we are able to accomplish many things that you can't do it as a single, you know, little isolated Christian. And so trust in the fact that God has put a body together, and as with every body, there are certain ones that perform certain functions. And so you have to put your trust in the fact that there are certain people who are in charge, uh, under Christ, always under Christ, as we see, who must give an account. But there are those who are directing and, and giving leadership to these, this beautiful thing called the church. Uh, and if, when that works smoothly and beautifully, amazing things happen. And so put trust into that, put confidence into the leaders that God has appointed to you. Um, I love, I love, the, I get this question a lot, where people will come up to me and they'll say, so you're a pastor, right? What is it that you do? <laughs> like, yeah, I know that you like preach on Sundays, but like during the week, like, what do you do? <laughs> I'm like, I do a lot. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot that I do. <laughs> you know, I, would, I mean, it would take ages to explain uh, what I do. And I don't want to say this like I'm, you know, a woe is me. It's not that case at all. I love my job. And you actually, you don't need this part. 
You guys are great. You guys are amazing. <laughs> and you, you do make my job a joy. Um, but, you know, there is a certain pre prevalent attitude that I get, that sometimes I get sometimes, which is like, I don't really understand what your point is. <laughs> you know, it's like, where do you fit into the whole picture? Uh, but God has put this thing together. Uh, and your attitude towards church can make church a burden or a joy to you personally. Okay? So your benefit is at risk here. If you come to church with a sense of like uh, disdain and, and a skepticism towards everything that's happening, it's not going to be a joy for you. It's not going to be a joy for me. Uh, but the benefit that is supposed to be reaped will be at stake unless you kind of submit to what God is doing through the church and submit to the leadership that he has placed in it as well. And I definitely don't get off scot-free. I give an account to. Verse 18 I was wrapping up here. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Simple. Pray. Pray for your church. Pray for its leaders. That's so. So to sum up together from verse seven to, to verse uh, nineteen, there is uh, I don't know. I didn't bother to count them, but there's. A few different things here. Firstly, uh, be willing to, to learn from others and to engage in discipleship. To stand your ground in the gospel. Don't, uh, you know, don't be tricked by the different type of messages which will come down then. The gospel will not change. Christ will not change. Uh, thirdly, we, the way that we, uh, we, you know, if you were ostracized by society, don't let that get you down. That distinctiveness that we are called to have will cause us to be ostracized sometimes, but know that you are with Christ when that happens. Uh, uh, I, uh, next, or fourthly, uh, the different ways we are to bring sacrifice to God is through worship and through generosity towards others. Uh, and then we respect our leaders and we pray for them too. And so that's the commands given to the church uh, as we are to operate as a church. And so this kind of almost brings us to the end of Hebrews. And so I want to just briefly give a, a kind of a, an encouragement to you from the whole book. When you read through the book of Hebrews, my hope and prayer to you is that, number one, you listen to the word of encouragement that it's meant to be to stay with Christ. I mean, that's what the whole thing's been about. Realize that with Christ you are in the best possible position uh, that you could be in. There's no greater than Christ. There is no other like Him. Secondly, that you grasp that full message that he has preached and that he has demonstrated of a risen Savior and all the hope and the love that that fills you with, the power, and the joy, and all that comes with it, that, that when you grasp that message, that engine that it puts within you, as you fix your eyes upon the author and perfecter of, that, of your faith, and heed the warnings, heed the warnings that it gives you of not falling away, not going astray, and hold on to the promises that this book gives you too. That by holding on, by allowing that message to grip your heart and to move you to action, it is going to bring you to the unshakable city, to that, that reward, that beautiful destiny that we are called towards as well. So I want to end with the final words, almost the final words. Uh, there's a little bit at the end, which is I'm not going to, I'm going to say because it's a little bit contextual, but the final exhortation given in the book of Hebrews is this, and I'll say this and then we'll just go into prayer. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so much for the greatness of the gospel, for the greatness of our salvation. Jesus, we turn to you and we are once again in awe. We want to, we want to worship you in reverence and in awe for all that you have done. We thank you, King Jesus, for who you are and what you have done in our life. It is our deepest hope and desire that we could live lives 
that would emulate your message in this world and bring others to know you as Lord and Savior. So we pray to that end that you may strengthen us each day. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so